college is all about protesting Kavanaugh, how Google is gathering information on your kids without your consent, and getting rid of this in favor of this, next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Duke. This is the show that covers the stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses across the nation and across the world. Greeting to all our loyal listeners. Welcome to our brand new ones. It's an honor to have you here. And if you haven't done so already, please, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere else to make sure that you never miss an episode of The Dr. Duke Show. Coming up later in the episode, we'll be talking to our international correspondent, Alex Newman, about the new ways that Google is collecting information on your kids in school without parental approval. So stick around for that. But first, I turn it over to uh, the one and only Katie Petrick for our top education stories of the week. Katie, what do you have today? We have all been waiting and we continue to wait to see what's going to be the outcome of the Kavanaugh investigation by the FBI. But in the meantime, uh, we are actually going to take a look at some college campuses and they've all been weighing in on what's happening. And so we have a couple stories where we're going to basically lead you through a progression. And uh, last week we talked about Yale University and how they canceled classes so students could go protest. And then we had Mississippi State professors who uh, canceled class or excused students to attend a moment of silence uh, for Kavanaugh's accusers. And a representative from Campus Reform actually attended this little moment of silence and they found that more faculty than students actually showed up. Now the Sociology of Families class, which is taught taught by Bert Montgomery, he canceled class and he sent an email to his students and he encouraged them that, you know, if you can't make it to this moment of silence, at least use social media. He says, if you are on campus, meet on the drill field at noon. If you aren't able to meet with these two groups, please walk out and take a photo posting with the uh, the tag, hashtag belief survivors. Yeah, so what you have here is a situ- more proof that universities are not in the business of educating your kids. They're certainly not in the, in the business of teaching kids what American law, jurisprudence, and justice is. They have no interest in constitutional due process. They have no interest in teaching kids about innocent until proven guilty. These are professors being paid by taxpayers to teach kids math and science and sociology and history who are now using that uh, perk to cancel classes, to demand kids walk out. The professors themselves, evidently more than and the students are walking out of their classrooms to offer some uh, coarse platitudes and moments of silence for the victims of the made-up Kavanaugh scandal. It, it is absolutely too much to have to deal with to think about this. When you, where is the professor revolt about the rule of law here? Where is the professor walk out over the fact that you're about to convict somebody, you've already convicted somebody on, on campuses and in the court of public opinion without a single, not one, zero ev- shred of evidence. So it, it just goes to show you that the social justice mindset that your kids are coming home with mom and dad, the social justice mindset that over Thanksgiving dinner, you can't just watch football and eat turkey giblets anymore. You have to hear about how from your night snot nosed 19 year old college sophomore, how Donald Trump is the antichrist this is where they're getting it from. You're handing over tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars to universities, or you're getting your kids into $100,000 worth of debt to attend these big crappy universities, and this is what they're getting there. Professors walking out of their classroom, begging students, if you won't show up in person, walk out of whatever class you're in. Hey, you're in a math class. You're taking a math test. Walk out of that and take a selfie with yourself, uh, take a selfie of yourself, send it on to the protest if you can't be there in person. Money well spent on college campuses, but It does signal, I think every story we're going to talk about today sort of ties into this now, how education is all about activism and it's not about anything else. Well, here's more activism because we have the one and only Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the New York's Democratic Socialist who uh, is an alumna of Boston University. And she went to Boston to speak to about 350 students on Monday. And she didn't outright say Kavanaugh lied. But here's what she did say. A generation ago, committing (laughs) perjury and lying to Congress multiple times in your nomination hearing would have been an automatic disqualifier. To see the rules that we are willing to dismantle just to insert a partisan pick is truly uh, disturbing. Uh, in her whole speech, she says that activism is the solution. She praised uh, the woman who got into the elevator with Senator Jeff Flake, if you remember that. Basically what happened is uh, Senator Jeff Flake said he would vote for Kavanaugh. Then he gets in an elevator and this uh, activist runs in there, 
locks herself in there, talks to him. And all of a sudden, at the very, again, 11th hour, he says, well, I'll vote for Kavanaugh to get it out of committee only if we have this now seventh FBI investigation. So uh, Cortez actually says the woman who actually uh, was the activist is from Cortez's own district in Queens. And she says, in fact, she's an immigrant activist or immigration activist, which just goes to show how intersectionality and how interwoven all of these fights are because she is putting everything on the line and risking deportation, not even for a direct immigration action, but for the action of all survivors. And that's how we need to be. So perjury disqualifies you for the Supreme Court, but evidently lying about your own background, fabricating your own background, trying to make your privileged ass upbringing look as if you're Jenny from the block, right? Look as if you're some beaten extra from uh, uh, West Side Story, which we'll talk about later. Uh, that, that, that not only does that not, d- d- doesn't disqualify you, it actually is a career enhancer. And you see what o- Cortez is basically saying. When it comes to truth, when it comes to law, when it comes to the Supreme Court, when it comes to justice, it doesn't matter what's true and false. It doesn't matter what is constitutional or not. What matters is your social, pro- ju- uh, social justice bona fides. All that matters is, is that you corner somebody in an elevator, start screaming at them. And if you're a weak spine beta male like like Jeff Flake, you cave. One ele- love in an elevator, right? Remember the old ele- yeah. uh, Aerosmith song? Love in an elevator, Ooh, right? Yeah. So that's apparently what happens. You get in an elevator with Jeff Flake, you bend his ear, you scream at him a little bit, and he gets off the elevator and voila, you have a social justice moment, a social justice gasm in the, or in the elevator. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and the irony is, is that this woman graduated from that university, Cortez, University of Boston. She doesn't know what socialism is. She doesn't understand what a free democracy is, right? She clearly doesn't understand the history of socialism. She knows she uh, graduated, I believe, with a, a degree in economics. Economics and international relations. And international relations. And she couldn't explain in any of the interviews she was given where the $32 trillion, her, 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 her simply, her, 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 her uh, uh, Medicare, her uh, universal health care package was going to come from. $32 trillion, an economics major from this Boston University can't explain in the first way where we're going to get the money for that. It's going to fall off trees. I would think that she's a perfect fit for this university. The University of Boston that graduated this idiot with a degree ought to give her a social justice PhD. We can call her Dr. Cortez now, because that means about as much as the rest of her credentials do. Well, speaking of a doctor, it was actually kind of interesting because in this same talk is when she said, you know, I actually, I went to Boston University University, and I was pre-med. So before she got to economics, she wanted to be a doctor. Whoo, Lord save us all. Um, I don't know, man. I, would you rather have her working on the constitution or working on your gallbladder? Uh, I don't know. It's I haven't thought call. about that one. That is a tough call. Tough call. Um, but yeah, I, I encourage our listeners to go out and actually watch the entire video because you can find the entire speech online. So go do that. Uh, but Meanwhile... Meanwhile, conservative speakers with actual degrees and actual accomplishments are getting booed off that same campus so that this half-wit liberal can stand there and spout her completely economically ignorant platitudes. It's the world we live in. It is. Uh, We also live in a world where a Georgetown professor, Christine Fair, of all the last names she could have, Christine Fair calls for white male Republican senators to suffer miserable deaths and be castrated. So... Christine Fair is a uh, security studies professor at Georgetown, and she's quite vocal on Twitter if you ever take a look at her account. She said in a tweet, look at this chorus of entitled white men justifying a serial rapist arrogated entitlement. All of them deserve miserable deaths while feminists laugh as they take their their last gasps. Bonus, we castrate their corpses and feed them to swine. Yes. So murdering somebody on the basis of their race, castrating somebody on the basis of their gender, having a big party to get a bunch of feminists around to laugh at it, supported by a tenured university professor at, wait for it, a Catholic Catholic university. University. There you go. Uh, Catholic Catholic University. University. So, uh, and what is the Catholic University's response to this? Well, Georgetown defended her right to voice her opinion. They 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 said, our policy does not prohibit speech based on the person presenting ideas or the content of those ideas, even when those ideas may be difficult, controversial, or objectionable. And they added that the university expects professors' classrooms and interaction with students be free of bias and geared toward thoughtful, respectful dialogue. Right, 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 right. So uh, we've seen stories from uh, from Georgetown now going back 10, 20 years where to actually defend 
Catholic values at Georgetown to actually speak out against abortion at Georgetown if you're a student or an administrator, or actually to defend traditional marriage if you're an administrator or a student, gets you in a world of hurt, gets you all sorts of protests, gets you all sorts of investigations. But to call for the murder and castration of a huge percentage of the American population, that's protected speech. Georgetown, this, you are the reason why the Catholic Church is in the problem it is now. Our so-called Catholic institutions of higher learning are a farce. We have the Vatican now, which has gone full socialist, never go full socialist. You got the Vatican now, that's become just a, an adjunct of left-wing progressive fever swamp liberation theology. And now we've got Catholic universities from Georgetown to, to Notre Dame and to everyone in between, between, who are more concerned with affecting the election politically than they are teaching the remotest of Catholic values. When the Catholic Church implodes, and it's well on its way, uh, the academic aspect of the Catholic Church, that was its glory, by the way. For two 2,000 years, 1,500 years, the glory of the Catholic Church has been its intellectual tradition as, as encapsulated in the schools. Now those schools are utterly indistinguishable from what goes on at the, George, uh, the Harvards and the Yales and the University of Texas's, right? Simple social justice posturing nonsense and a really lack of a commitment to a solid education period, let alone a Christian education. However, they are quite woke at Green Mountain uh. College because they are offering a two-week pop-up course, like Lululemon pop-up. So a two-week pop-up course to discuss sexual assault allegations against Brett Kavanaugh and the hookup culture and how it may encourage sexual assault. This course is called Brett Kavanaugh, Boys Will Be Boys, and it's worth a half credit. But see, this is the thing that I, we, we started this show talking about. This is what's happening at your universities. They are now actually creating in the middle of a semester a course to react to popular culture. So anything that, that honks a liberal off, anything that a progressive finds unacceptable, even in the middle of a semester when kids have already paid for their classes, places like Green, Green Mountain, Vermont, are creating pop-up courses. It's like, remember in the 1990s that stupid MTV pop-ups where you'd watch a music video and they'd pop up all these little bubbles where they explained it? This is an education. This, this, is, this is what you get when bias response teams actually trump a faculty ability to teach the truth. What you're doing now is you're creating, and I'm betting within 10 years, universities won't even have curriculum. They won't even have syllabuses anymore. Universities aren't even going to offer courses. They're just going to, you show up in September, you pay your money, and then a group of liberal faculty will decide, once you show up, what progressive stories you should be exposed to for the remaining semester. So in other words, Coursework, why, why offer coursework that is retrograde, right? Co coursework that focuses on history or focuses on mathematics as it goes backwards or focuses on science that white male scientists invented 2,000 years ago. Why don't we just wait till you get there you pay us your money, then we'll tell you what courses you should be concerned about. You should be concerned about Kavanaugh. You should be concerned about Kankel's Hillary Clinton. You should be concerned about sexual uh, 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 harassment in the workplace. You should be concerned about ha hashtag me too. So we'll get rid of all those boring, racist, sexist, bigoted classes like math and science and history, and we're gonna make your universities one experience in wokeness, one constant experience and wokeness. And notice how facile this is. So one story burns out, here comes another one. Let's shift our focus to this social justice outrage. One long, unabated, unremitted exercise in leftist political posturing. And it makes perfect sense because the way our culture is, our attention spans last maybe two weeks if we're lucky. That's right. And with this specific course, they're meeting four times total. Tuesday and Friday, and it's going to be two hours each time. So, of course, I did the math. And depending on how their credits work out, but an individual credit, and this is a half credit, this half credit is going to cost them $592 or $148 per class period that they attend. Right. And it's four class periods. And it's going to be, what you're going to get is a, a straight rote lecture about why Kavanaugh shouldn't be confirmed. And what you're really paying for, what's the payoff for the professors? The activist call to arms. In the middle of a semester, you can ignore your other classes, you can sign up for this, and you pay all that money, and what you're going to be is weaponized. You will be weaponized while the crisis is ongoing to get out there. How much do you want to bet that they would waive that last class or waive half the classes if it meant kids after two lectures got on a bus, drove down to Washington, and stood in the hallways of uh, the Capitol protesting these hearings. I'm guessing that's the final. I think that's that is probably the, fi the final. That's anyway. your final exam. That's, that's your right. final exam. Uh, hey, and if you can get yourself in an elevator with Jeff Flake. Bonus. You love in an elevator. Automatic A+. Living it up while we're going down. 
Uh, these students, just for the record, so everyone knows, it's a small liberal arts college, obviously, and they, if they live on campus and have to pay room and board, they're paying fifty thousand dollars a year. Fifty thousand dollars <laughs> for a four-hour class. Yeah. That is all about protesting Brett, Brett Kavanaugh. Yep. There you go. That's where we're at. at Evergreen, does, that, does Evergreen State University ring a bell? <laughs> On the other side. Does, does, sure. that, does that ring a bell, right? Uh, when you go full activist, full on activist, pay attention to what happened at Evergreen, coming to a Vermont college near you. Basically, just don't have green in your title because that's doomsday. So the thing is, what are all the stories so far that we've talked about? What's the end result? We don't officially know, but we do know that these stories have ended up now with directly affecting Brett Kavanaugh um, because it was announced that he's bowing out of teaching at Harvard Law. He was supposed to teach a winter class in January and graduates of Harvard have been lining up against him. They signed a letter and more than it was like 800 Harvard Law School graduates have signed this letter. In the letter they addressed to Dean John Manning they say and this was three days they got all these signatures so now more than ever hls harvard law school must send a clear message that it takes sexual violence seriously the accusations against judge kavanaugh including those by dr christine blazy ford are credible and grave they seriously call into question his character and morality and should disqualify disqualify him from any position of esteem including lectureships at harvard law school you're a law school this is Harvard Law. This is supposed to be the place you go if you're going to be a lawyer where every legal firm in the country opens its doors once you graduate. And your argument is that even spite the, despite the fact that there is no credible, no evidence whatsoever, an allegation from a woman who has contradicted herself multiple times, whose own memory has failed her, who's apparently now lied about her fear of flying, lied about ne- ne- needing to live in a, a, door, a, a house with two front doors, lied apparently about never coaching anybody on a polygraph test, a woman who has lied to the highest committee in the land investigating the Supreme Court, as well as the FBI. Can somebody define the word credible for me? I always thought I knew what it meant. Somebody who was worthy to be believed because there was evidence and meaning behind what she said. Where is it? We're long past that. This is the left. Vocabulary words change depending upon what they want. Credible now means you can be an outright flake and a liar. You can have a a completely inconsistent story. You can admit that you don't remember much from 36 years ago, but you're absolutely convinced that the guy sitting in front of you is a rapist. That now is the definition of credible for American universities and American law schools. And I really want to see, because it's, 800 Harvard Law School graduates. So these are these aren't even students anymore. These are actual graduates. They're which, lawyers. They're lo- well, if they pass the bar. But anyway, I want to know because of our Supreme Court currently. I I know they probably didn't, but I just want to see on this list of 800 who's on there. I'll start a little conspiracy theory. Anyway. Uh, We're going to switch over because we're going to go to the K-12 schools. We're going to go down to Texas where a Fort Worth public school system, uh, their public school libraries are exposing children to graphic gender ideology without any parental consent or notice. And basically they took a look at what the library books are in the, across the whole Fort Worth public school system. And since 2016, the libraries have doubled their selection of books that are labeled with the keyword transgender. Now there's a total of 98 titles with 275 copies of the books, but this doesn't include LGBT or gender identity. It's just when you type in the keyword transgender. Now let's compare this uh, for books like quantum physics or 3D printing, uh, petroleum engineering. That one only has eight records or quantum physics only has 44. Uh, In the keyword calculus gets you just 55 records. Trigonometry, 20. So what it's showing is that our children are being exposed to all the different uh, transgender type books. And at the same time, this is the same school system that is failing its kids academically yeah. because they can't read and they can't do math. During the Common Core uproar of four and five and six years ago, there were a number of articles about how high school and middle school libraries all across this country, public school libraries, were pulling the classics off the shelves. They had a fire sale, copies of the Odyssey for 10 cents, the Iliad, pulling down Shakespeare's books, pulling down the great books of Western culture. And everybody was outraged about it, but no one thought twice about it until we realized now what was happening. All the classics of Western culture, books that were dedicated to critical thinking, books that were dedicated to the evolution of freedom and liberty in Western culture, books that were dedicated to the origins of civil rights and civil liberties, those books had to go because they didn't tell a progressive story. They did not push the social justice narrative. Those books are gone now. 
And so it's not like your kids can walk into one of these goofy high school libraries and say, you know what, I'm going to avoid those 47 books on transgender families for ninth graders, and I'm going to read instead a tale of two cities. No, there is no option anymore. What they're doing in the libraries perfectly matches what's going on in the law schools and what's going on in the college campuses. We are transforming American education into a lockstep deep march into progressive politics and activism. And the books that these kids are going to be exposed to from the time they're about to begin reading, and in, 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 uh, even late elementary school, are all going to be books that promote a certain kind of worldview and a certain kind of message. So that by the time these kids get to college, it used to be that as a university professor, it used to be for me, kids would get to college ignorant, but but not political. 25 years ago, my first university students were pretty ignorant of history and culture. They didn't read very well, their math skills were lousy, but they weren't politicized, which means there was a certain humility there about what they didn't know. Now, 25 years later, my kids come to school at the university dumber than ever before, more, less literate than ever before, and way, way more politically cocksure that whatever they think is true without the slightest, bit of evidence or credibility must be gospel, right? They believe it, it has to be true because it conforms to the politics we've handled them at the, handed them at the lower grades. And an example of a book they probably will have read by the time they get to you is Beautiful Music for Ugly Children. Uh, Gabe has always identified as a boy, but he was born with a girl's body. With his new public access radio show gaining in popularity, Gabe struggles with romance, friendships, and parents, all while trying to come out as transgendered. And the thing that gets me even more, you can say, well, hey, at least they're reading books. You'd think, right? That's the argument I've heard. But according to the 2017 National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP scores, the fourth graders of the Fort Worth School District, only 19% of them are proficient in reading. 19%. By the time they get to eighth grade, only 16% are mm. proficient in reading. Yeah, you know, this, this argument that they're reading books. Well, it's 1935 in Germany, and our kids are reading Mein Kampf at four, in fourth grade. Our kids really aren't reading Dostoevsky or Tolstoy anymore. But they're reading Das Kapital, right? So we should be glad about that. And as we now know, as you pointed out, and this, this confirms our thesis as well, uh, they're reading crap and they still don't know how to, to read, read. Yep. right? And that's, and that's kind of what you want, to believe the garbage peddled by liberals, to believe the garbage peddled by progressives about sexuality, about chemistry, about, the, about global warming, to believe all of this nonsense propaganda. You really probably shouldn't be able to read at a high level. The one thing you don't want is kids to meander in to some bookstore and heaven forbid pick up a real book and then learn the truth through that. So this, this conjunction of politicized work, politica, politicized readings, and low literacy, that's the perfect storm for getting an, a, an Ocasio-Cortez. She is the product. You want to see what happens when kids get highly politicized literature and don't, aren't intelligent enough or not educated enough to read very well? You get Alexandria Cortez in New York. That's what you end up with. I know people are outraged, and they should be outraged, but the thing is you can't just sit there and be outraged and do nothing about it because we have uh, not only in our schools but in our public library system we have the drag queen story hour happening, and we are seeing at least some small communities push back, and that's what needs to be done if, if they want anything to change. So it's actually – there's a website called the Drag Queen Story Hour. They have their own website, and it says – Drag Queen Story Hour is just what it sounds like. Drag queens reading stories to children in libraries, schools, and bookstores. So they're coming into the schools as well. They capture the imagination and play of the gender fluidity of childhood and gives kids glamorous, positive, and unabashedly queer role models. In spaces like this, kids are able to see people who defy rigid gender restrictions and imagine a world where people can present as they wish, where dress up is real. Where dress up is real. In other words, it's, it's, a play, it's all play. We talked about what happens at the middle school and high school libraries and public schools, but many of our community libraries, too, have gone down this path. They have removed many of the great books of Western culture. Uh, if you walk into a typical local community library now, you're going to be pretty surprised what's on the shelf. The thing is about these drag queen story hours, there's 27 chapters in you know big cities, but they're coming to the small communities, and it's the small communities that are pushing back. Good. And it's the, it's the mom and dads, the religious groups. You need to go to the local... Uh, village board or town hall, whatever it is where these libraries are, and go talk to the people. Because at village board, just like at school board meetings, there's no one there. So if you show up, they will listen And if you're in a small community. Well, what's really disturbing about this is that these drag queens are obviously reading to kids too young to read themselves. This is the story hour that you would usually have for four and five and six-year-olds. Although, given the current state of education, I suppose they could be reading to 11th graders, these drag queens, given the reading literacy levels. 
But the problem with this is, is that again, we never used to read books to five and six year olds at story time. When, when Sherry, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop got up there at the library, they were reading books about clouds and puppies and monkeys. They Best weren't reading ever. books about the sexuality of clouds and puppies and monkeys. They were reading books about childhood experiences and fantasy scenes. You've got sexuality advocates now, activists in drag, teaching radical sexual politics to four and five and six year olds now. And if it wasn't, if it wouldn't have been acceptable 25 or 30 or 100 years ago to sexualize children in public libraries. Why is it okay now? Well, it's okay to sexualize children in schools because we have the BBC, we're going across the pond here, the BBC has published a video that showed six-year-olds writing gay love letters as part of a lesson to promote diversity. And it's uh, on the BBC's Radio Manchester Facebook page, they shared this video. It's Busey Lodge Primary School uh, and they, they go through the video, you'll see it here. Uh, the six-year-olds are actually writing about gay marriage. In the, the video, teacher Sarah Hobson says, this class of six-year-olds is learning about gay marriage. In this fairy tale, the prince wants to marry his male servant, and the children are writing a love letter. And she said, the more children can be accepting at this age, you're not going to face it further on, because the children will be accepting now and will be accepting this diversity around them. In other words, you're going to brainwash them. Exactly. Kids too young to understand the dynamics of actual sexual relationships. Kids at five and six too young to understand the mechanics or the ethos, ethos or the morality or the spirituality involved in sexuality are now being brainwashed. Again, it makes the point we just made. A six-year-old is being asked to write a love letter between a prince and his footman, right? And, and to make it a love letter. So it's going to have to have romance. It's going to have to have sexual innuendo. It's going to have to talk about physical and emotional love between two men when they are not even really old enough to understand what those things mean between a man and a woman. And what are you doing? You are not staving off diversity in the, uh, uh, what you call diversity in the future. You are not staving off homophobia in the future. You are embracing and indoctrinating in kids uh, the kinds of sexual attitudes you as progressive teachers want those kids to have. You are not letting them decide for themselves. You are not letting parents and the local religious communities of those parents have any say whatsoever in how those kids are gonna believe about sex, what they're gonna believe. You're putting ideas into their heads because they're your captive audience. And none of this has anything to do with education at all. And yet, it's England and it's coming to a primary school to you in this country. Doesn't matter what you think. When they get your kids, when you sus uh, subscribe to send your kids to public schools, when you decide that the government school should educate your kids, you, you don't realize this yet, mom and dad, but by that simple act of putting your kids in pu public government schools, you have already written away your parental rights. Your parental rights that they get an education, your parental rights to make sure they can read and write and do math, they're not doing it. The, your parental rights to teach your kids morals and values and religion, you have given it up the moment you sign your kid up for a public government school. That's true across the pond, and it's true here. So get used to it. If, you're, if you want the so-called free daycare of eight hours a day of public schooling, if you think it's the government's job to provide hot lunches and breakfast to your kids in a government forum when they pretend to teach them real subject matter, then take what you get. You are signing away your parental prerogatives when you enroll them in public schools. All right, we'll let you cool down. Uh, let's go to an interview that Dr. Duke did earlier with Alex Newman. Alex, thank you so much for joining us again today. And we have a really interesting story, one that you and I have been talking for a, about for a long time. Another one of those we told you so stories. We now have really serious evidence that Google is using its classroom technology primarily through Google Chrome. All this so-called wonderful free technology that our kids are getting in the public schools being used to collect data on our kids, spy on our kids, turn that uh, data over to government agencies and to market it to sell information about our kids. Talk about the what, where, when, and why about this, Alex. What's happening with Google? Well, thank you so much for having me, Duke. And so what's happening is Google has been busted yet again, and this is you know several times now in several years that they've been caught spying on students. So um, they, they now have access to kids uh, all over the United States, all over the world, 
through a variety of different technologies that they offer. One of them is they call it the uh, the G Suite for Education. They had to do a little bit of rebranding after their uh, Google Apps for Education got busted spying on the kids and you know keeping track of all the websites they visit, the videos they watch, their passwords, you know, just mining data mining their email. So they had to rebrand it. it was, now it's the G Suites for Education. And again, same issues. Um, they also have these uh, Google Chromebooks that uh, basically it's, it seems like they're finding ways to get them at the lowest possible price so that they can make money off the data that they're collecting. So what they do is that they, they offer these kind of like laptops, they call Google Chromebooks to students and, and uh, at least 25 million students now have these. Um, and they give them to all the kids and they all use all these Google products and services that are supposed to be free. And again, harvesting and collecting and mining and, and selling and profiting off of this data. And uh, they've been caught now repeatedly doing this. Of course, they're doing it to every other American who uses their products as well, right? Anyone who uses Gmail, anyone who searches on Google, anyone who uses any of their so-called free apps. But it's especially troubling because here we're dealing with kids who are, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. They never gave consent. They were never told that their data was going to be permanently stored. Their parents never gave consent and their parents were never told what was going to happen. Uh, so, you know, people like Michelle Malkin now are calling these people the uh, kitty data predators, right? I mean, this is serious stuff. They're stealing this information from children without even this, the most mild, you know, acceptable form of consent from parents or anyone else. And uh, it's a repeated problem over and over again. Talk a little bit, Alex, about the, the how this is being used by government, too. How is Google using all of this information, both in the classroom to help uh, social justice teachers uh, push their agenda and broader at the Federal Department of Education? Oh, that's right. And you know, this is a kind of incestuous, you might not even call it a fascist relationship between big government and big corporations. So on the one hand, you have the government imposing all these mandates, requiring or purporting to require all this technology, um, you know, mandating all these social and emotional learning and all this data gathering and all this data mining, things like the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act are a big part of the problem that mandate all this collection. Of course, Common Core requires all this data collection. And on the other, you have these big private companies like Google and plenty of others that are involved in helping to uh, supply this uh, technology and this data mining stuff. So what you have here is this disgusting, grotesque partnership where children, families and privacy are the victims and big government and big business get to spy on you, get to manipulate you get to feed uh, you know horrible things to your children. You mentioned uh, EBS CEO, the EBSCO Information Services. You know, after we put out that article, I got an email from a state school board member. They gave me the password for a, a student account so that I could look in there. And it was even worse than we realized. I mean, it, I found stuff advocating and making light of incest, of, of, of rape of children uh, by random people. I mean, just horrible. So, And I found that within five minutes of looking. Uh, it is so grotesque. And you can bet that all these big tech technology companies are a part of this problem, feeding filth into the minds of your children and spying on them. And of course, big government is using a lot of this data collection to perfect their indoctrination system. So they have this social and emotional learning. What they want to do is figure out, you know, is our indoctrination working? You know, how does the student respond to this type of stimuli? And if we're not getting the desired response, if we're not getting the desired reaction, then we need to, uh, you know, reemphasize and reemphasize and keep working on this. So this is all coming together in this big, horrifying machine that exists primarily to indoctrinate, dumb down, uh, and spy on, and centrally plan the economy, but to, to do all these things to children. It's uh, it's insane, it's grotesque, but, uh, and you know, people need to remember too, Google is not a neutral company. You know, just in the last few weeks, we've had scandals the, the video that got leaked through Breitbart, where you had their top executives, CEOs and top executives practically crying that Trump had won and talking about we're going to do everything we can to undo this. And we tried to help Hillary and we tried to get out Latino voters and none of it worked. Oh, my goodness. You know, this is not a neutral company. This is a company with a political agenda. Uh, their, their slogan used to be don't be evil. I understand they dropped that now because they're becoming so evil. But uh, this is just absolutely nuts. And, you know, I wouldn't trust Google with anything, much less my most sensitive private data and my browsing habits and my YouTube video searches. It's bad, bad news. And again, this is all being done involuntarily without consent. And it's going into these permanent records. 
Well, and again, Google has uh, promised again and again and again over the years that they wouldn't do this. They would not use our kids in the schools. How many school administrators, Alex, have looked you and, the, uh, you and I in the eye and said, those will never happen in our schools. Our schools would never let this happen. How many state legislatures had this question brought before them by anti-Common Core activists? And none of it's gone anywhere in all the states. seems to me that the states are pretty well confederate, if either, either confederate with Google through ignorance or through apathy and consent. I can't tell which it is. Okay. It's, it's just a combination of both, you know, um, that you have the federal government imposing all these mandates and then Google coming in and saying, hey, we'll give you free stuff. Right. And, you know, I, I teach in my economics class at Freedom Project Academy. One of the very first things we go over is there is no such thing as a free lunch. Right. In this case, when Google gives you free things, you are the product. Right. They are making money off of you. They're making money off of your data. They're manipulating you. They're spying on you and they're making big bucks from that data. Right. They're they're feeding you ad advertisements they're uh, selling the data and it you know this is just absolutely crazy stuff it needs to stop uh, Google ought not be in the classroom in fact I, I've tried to completely sever all ties with Google in my life it's a terrible company uh, and uh, you know they have a, a very dark agenda and I think as people dig deeper into what this agenda is they'll come to the conclusion that it is completely inappropriate for them to be in our children's classrooms let the free markets be your guide choose something else to get your information out there Alex Newman thanks again for another important report and we will talk to you soon. For the final segment today, we are going to add to the ever-growing list of microaggressions. And today's edition is clapping because in England at Manchester University, back at Manchester, uh, clapping can trigger anxiety for some students. So at the student union's first union meeting of the year, Manchester's liberation and access officer don't know what that means. Sarah Khan argued that the, the traditional applause was not sufficiently accessible to all students. The motion states, loud noises, including whooping and traditional applause, can pose an issue for students with disabilities, such as anxiety or sensory issues. So, from now on... Jazz hands. Jazz hands. Can you give me an example so, of jazz hands? The university at Manchester has argued that clapping is disturbing to people. Whooping and shouting is disturbing to some people with anxiety disorder. So now when you want to signal your opprobrium, you have to do These are spirit fingers. And these are gold. So I got a couple of, I got a, as you might imagine, I got a couple of questions about this. Just a few. Number one, what are we doing about our blind colleagues? If this is an officer in charge of accessibility, right? This is an officer in charge of liberation and accessibility, basically. How Li making kids. She, yeah, this student, liberation and access officer, that's her right. title. That's she right. So as an access officer, so she's a social diversity warrior whose job it is to make sure that everybody feels welcome. And if you are blind, you can't see this. Can't see this. You've got. And by the way, I have a racial protest, a grievance here. Jazz is universally associated with African-American artists. Why are you singling out, why do we call this jazz hands? These hands are white. These hands do not have the calluses of slavery upon them. When you call upon me to jazz hands my, I am appropriating African-American culture. This is unacceptable. How is this liberation based? Allowing whitey, to do the jazz hands. And what about, again, our, speaking of, what about Stevie Wonder? Thank you, Think finally. About, St can you imagine poor Stevie at Madison Square Garden? He just gets through a rousing rendition of Sir Duke, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course you pick very, Sir Duke of all songs. Very jazzy, you pick Sir very Duke. jazzy, right? Yeah, that's true. And at the end of it all, he, you know, he gives his smile and performance, and at the end of it all, 60,000 people. Yeah, if you haven't seen Robin Williams, doesn't scare me the W waved at Stevie Wonder. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Stevie's only been blind since birth. And there's W going, Stevie! Even Stevie Wonder's going, does he think I'm looking for him? It's too good. And you have a second story here that's going to be e e oh, equally mockable. Absolutely. So at Kent State School of Theater and Dance, they are canceling West Side Story because students are complaining about the cast list. We have junior musical theater major Bridget Martinez, uh, who has Puerto Rican heritage. She said that she was disappointed that she was cast as Maria's understudy. And she 
I actually told KentWire.com, I think it's one of their student publications, her sad story. And then she got really upset when she saw actually the full cast list. She says, I was just blown away because it was not correct at all. <laughs> and uh, a fellow uh, theater major, Viviana Cardenas, uh, also identifies as Latina. And she got a callback for uh, one of the roles as Anita which is, again, one of the main roles. But that role went to an African-American student, and so now she's upset. And she says, it's more than just getting a role. I don't get to tell other people's stories because of the color of my skin. But yet when there is this story that is about people of cultures like me, about people of color like me, and that gets taken away from me, that was the most heartbreaking. Wait, a, a Latina actress was, had a role taken from her by an African-American actress? Yes. Oh, isn't it precious when the liberals eat their own? But this is the problem. We can't sit back as conservatives and applaud this because it, it well, would seem well, it, first, it, you, you have liberals devouring their own, but here's the problem. What suffers in the end is art. And so what did the university, what could Kent State University well, do? Well, first, before we even get to that, Cardenas, she, she has the best quote I've, I think I've ever heard. She says, I think the professors who made the decision wanted the best for the show, and that's what they considered, and that's it. I think there are more things that need to be considered than just that. So an actress is mad that the director actually chose the best person for the part to make the show the best it could. That's right. It's just not fair. And that's not what's not fair. And you see this is the death of art, right? But not only is it the death of art, it's the death of all things. If you are only allowed, this has always blown me away, if you're only allowed to act or write from the perspective of exactly what you are, then you gotta get rid of all the history, and that's what they're doing. You've gotta purge all literature, not just Western literature. I mean, the fact that Shakespeare imaginatively, imaginatively created a character like Shylock, who was Jewish, can't have that anymore. That, that is an affront. The, the fact that Shakespeare created Othello, an African character, and I can't have that. Uh, anytime, and any, when, J, when uh, the great writer, the Victorian writers, right? When um, uh, the Brontes create Bronte male sisters. characters, when Jane Austen creates Mr. Darcy, no, 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 no. She has no right to do that. She's a woman. And when an African American wins a lead role in a in a play about Puerto Ricans, and a Puerto Rican girl comes in second, got to get rid of that, right? And you see it whether it's at the University of Manchester, where where you 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 can't clap anymore, where inclusion means this, right? Uh, and the, and all the appropriations that come with this, and all the uh, unaccommodious ways that this handles people who are otherwise sighted, right? The blind. And, and what you've got going on at Kent State University now, just cancel it. What are you going to put on now? What so, are you going to? And by that argument, you probably can't put on any traditional classical plays that were written by whites. Nothing from Aeschylus and Sophocles all the way to Ma Carol Churchill. White playwrights, you can't put their plays on anymore because to do so means you would have to cast white actors only, which would exclude non-white actresses and actors. Uh, despite the fact that for about 30 years now, we've been filling Shakespeare's plays with anybody of a different race we can. We're setting them in Africa. We're setting them in India just so that we can claim diversity. But as you and I both know, that doesn't, it's not how this works. Uh, minorities must play white characters. But white characters or even black characters playing Puerto Rican characters now is not acceptable. And so what you see here is pro exactly what progressivism is. Progressivism claims to care so much about diversity, they're willing to put a gun to your head. They're willing to cancel the art, the culture. They're willing to burn and censor all the great books of Western culture. In the name of diversity, they will put a gun to your temple. And yet, when you look at what they're doing, ultimately, it is the destruction of diversity. All right, well, if you like what you saw on today's show, make sure you head over to drdukeshow.com and subscribe to the podcast. Listen on all of your favorite platforms. And that does it for us this week on The Dr. Duke Show. If you like what you've heard, please share the podcast with your friends and tell them to subscribe. Do not email us. Do not applaud for us. Just give us spirit fingers. All right? We won't ask, for, the, for those who have palm issues, we won't ask for the full jazz hands. It's too much stress on the palms. But spirit fingers. It really helps us out if you subscribe. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And God willing, we'll see you next time. <laughs>